You're watching Leafs Morning Take with host Nick Alberga and former NHLer Jay Rosehill. The show starts now. All right, what's good, everybody? Presented by Batano, it's time for the Tuesday edition of Leafs Morning Take. Nick Alberga and Anthony Stewart. What's going on, Stewie? Not too much. How's everything going on your end? Good. Um, a, a lot to dissect from, obviously, April Fools and that clash with the Florida Panthers. Uh, it's it's a fascinating time of year because I don't know how to take these wins and losses for any team, never mind the Toronto Maple Leafs. What's your general feel this time of year, Stu? Well, I, I think at this point, uh, anything is a, a victory, right? Whether it's moral or by, <laughs> you know, on the scoreboard. But I think, you know, you're going to take it at face value. You know, they have a pretty good record against this Florida Panther team this year. Uh, but I think it was a statement win, right? I know they came back in the third period and scored some goals in garbage time, but you heard Sheldon keep mention he was giving some other guys an opportunity to play and and show what they can do. Uh, but they dominated that game for the most part. Yes, yeah, Samson off on his head made some big, big saves, but the big dog stepped up. Uh, they got some depth scoring. They had some unsung heroes. And I think that's the key in showing that this team's different in years past. Yeah, that's the hope. That's the expectation come playoff time. Of course, Stanley Cup playoffs projected to get underway on April 20th. So that still leaves eight games. That leaves uh, 18 days until then. And I think if you're Sheldon Keefe, you just want to look for progression, right? I think you want to pick apart the good points and maybe not look necessarily at the negative points. There's a lot of pros and cons from that game against the Florida Panthers. So we'll get to that. I know you had a chance to call some OHL Cup action over the weekend. How was that? Yes, it was good. It was my first time doing uh, being a color analyst, right? So a lot of prep had to go in. So again, I can do anything. I'm a quick study, but uh, it was great seeing just that atmosphere at the GTHL level, U16. And you know, I think the pa- the fans were 1,200 fans. Uh, great atmosphere. It's great seeing all the scouts and seeing some former teammates and and friends that are now working at the OHL level. But most importantly, it's good to see the future. Uh, of the game of hockey, not just at the OHL, and some great, great players, and Ethan Belchett's coming up, Adam Valentini, um, and others uh, that are going to be the future of the game. So for me, you know, in the role that I'm doing in some of the minor hockey, it's the forecast of the future, and it's good to see that the game's going to be in good hands because some of these kids are way better than myself when I played at that age. Yeah, I was going to say, let's not lose sight of the fact that we're talking to a Kingston Frontenac's legend who had his number retired there. But like, did it bring you back to the grassroots to those levels where you were playing and going up the pipeline in junior hockey and then one day obviously ending up in the National Hockey League? It had to bring back a bit of the feels, no? It did. And the one thing I can say is like, I don't remember it, you know, remember the scouts and the long black coats. And I just remember at that age going out and playing, not really feeling pressure. I knew I was going to be a first rounder. The question was, was I going to go to Oshawa or the Sioux? I ended up going to Kingston, which was a great choice because I had an opportunity to play right away. So, you know, I think the messaging is, and just talking to some of these young kids, there's different uh, routes to success in hockey. It's not just the NHL. And, you know, if you're so worried about the draft and what I tell these kids, I said, you know where my brother Chris was playing uh, his OHL draft year? And the answer is he wasn't even playing hockey. He was playing football. So that, <laughs> that should be a message in itself uh, just to keep working at it. But uh, for the ones that are going to go on to be stars, it's great to recognize them and see them at such a young age and then perform at a high level. So I had some eyes on you uh, during the OHL Cup. The one thing that was miss- missing was was nation gear, but that's not your fault because we haven't hooked you up with some nation gear just yet, but I got the perfect sale for you. Go wild with nation gears, end of regular season, merch madness sale, a Stewie special there with the pun. Uh, nation gear is offering our favorite fans 20% off all regular season merch and free shipping on orders over $200. Stock up your closet and grab that merch you've been eyeing up all season long. Don't wait. This sale only lasts from April 1st to 7th, 2024. Shop the sale at nationgear.ca. By the way, I know in the description it says Jeff O'Neill. It doesn't look like we're going to get O'Dog on today's show. Down the road we will as we get closer and closer to the Stanley Cup playoffs. It's just the unfortunate nature of booking shows this day. Uh, these days just don't know what's going to happen, what is, what isn't. Uh, but again, uh, a lot to break down on today's show. And uh, certainly, I think from this Maple Leafs perspective, uh, there's a lot to talk about, obviously, with some of the injury returns. We'll see what happens here at practice at the morning skate as well. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page at the Leafs Nation 401. Once again, at the Leafs Nation 401, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, Leafs Morning Take, wherever you find your podcasts. Uh, leave us a five star review and maybe a review. That'd be fantastic with a little written portion as well. That would be great. Brought to you by DoorDash. It's time for the appetizer. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off 
up to $10 in value and zero delivery fees in the first order, $15 or more. When you download the DoorDash app, enter code NATION25. It's code NATION25. All in uppercase, 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Offer valid in Canada. Subject to change. Terms apply. So a 6-4 victory against the Florida Panthers. First and foremost, how did you leave that game feeling? Because I was sort of conflicted. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I know you're going to say, yeah. And, and again, I had, I know you had the tweets ready to fire off and saying, oh, this team is just like the team of old and giving up that uh, lead. Uh, but, you know, it, it was all part of the, of the plan. And you heard Sheldon Keith mention that, yes, he could have maybe played his top guys a little bit more. But if that was the case now where you're double shifting Matthews and these guys to get that win and someone gets hurt, the, the narrative is going to shift. So I do not mind him playing some of these other guys, giving guys an opportunity to get some more minutes. And in years past, I think what separates this group is that bottom six is performing. And the power play has sort of been struggling as of late, but they're getting key goals at key time from their bottom six and those players. Uh, so that's good to see. So, yes, on, on the whole, yeah, do you want to be cruising uh, with a 5-1 lead to a 5-2, 6-2 win? Yes. Uh, but he was the first to say in Sheldon Keefe and mentioning, hey, we're giving guys an opportunity. We're giving guys, uh, you know, some leeway and a little bit of rope to show exactly what they can do. And you're going to need these guys. You're going to need Nick Roberts and Nyes. You're going to need that third line performing at a high level. So you got to give them that opportunity and that chance to fail uh, if you're planning on going four rounds. You're not going to be able to do it with just your top dog and uh, Matthew scoring you know, 20, 25 goals in the playoffs. You need your depth guys stepping up and they need to show what they can do. And I think yesterday they got the opportunity. Did they pass with flying colors? No, but they still found a way to get the W. So that's how you read it. Um, because again, it's like every time I see it, it's like pulling the Band-Aid off. Now, granted, they got the two points. In the playoffs specifically, you win. A win is a win is a win. The old cliche. In the regular season, a bit of a different story. Obviously, as you mentioned, I think there's a lot of positives to grab for the game. Obviously, anytime you build up a 5-1 lead against one of the best teams in hockey, specifically the best defensive team in hockey, I'm going to feel pretty damn good about you. It's just like this letdown, this lull that we've seen where like, yeah, you let the first goal in, but don't let two more. Don't let a post. Like it could have easily been a 5-5 game. Now, granted, they found a way. I thought it was even hairy the way Austin Matthews scored the empty netter where it's like he was trying to dangle. Then I think it was Barkov stole the puck. Then he got it back. I'm like, man, it's just you got to clean things like that up defensively. I get it. You're gunning for, for 70 goals and all that stuff, but um, suffice it is to say, I think there's a lot to clean up from that game. I just, uh, I won't lie. I left it like feeling a bit conflicted because I've seen that type of rodeo before where they couldn't put their foot on the gas and just call it a night. Like I know what happens around the league Stewie, but it just seems like the Leafs have been synonymous for those type of games where they can't chip and chase and call it a night. And suddenly a game that had no business being close becomes close. Like we just saw it a couple weeks ago in, against Edmonton too. Well, I'm, I'm checking my notes right now, and um, I think they were missing two of their top four defensemen, right? So you're talking about some D-zone breakdowns yeah. and stuff like that too, but uh, no Morgan Riley and no uh, Timothy Lilligren, who have been key components to that back end, right? And, you know, uh, another fact is if you're going to be going and making a long playoff run, you're going to need seven, eight, nine defensemen. And it's good to see Giordano get an opportunity and Timmons, who's got three assists in his last five games. He struggled a little bit handling that puck. But you got to give guys repetition, repetition, because I think if you're trying to make a run and going on a long run, you can't do it just being top heavy. You have to have some unsung heroes. And I think the difference is with this team, you know, when you're looking back in, in years past, if it's not your top guys going, who's going to be that guy that scores that big goal in game seven in, in round two? And when you go down the lineup this year, it could be a nice, it could be a Domi, it could be a Bertuzzi. You saw Bertuzzi's goal last night. That's a, that's a, when's the last time you've seen that consistently? A guy going to the net, tapping in those, you know, those dirty area goals. So that's, that's more um, positive for me. The positives outweigh the negative just because the type of goals they scored yesterday. Um, yes, they did let it get uh, close, but they're missing two of their top defensemen and they're giving guys. Um, a little bit of a rest as well, too. So, again, I saw you tweet it yesterday saying, oh, it's happening again, or what's the fourth line doing out there with a minute and a half? you got to give guys an opportunity to see what you got going into the playoffs, especially if you're planning on making a long run like this Leafs team is this year. Yeah, and I think, to be honest, like a lot of Leafs fans, it, it just wasn't me. Like, you lose sight of the greater goal. 
I mean, the Leafs will never admit this, but you give up one in that game, it's not the end of the world because they're almost preparing themselves to take on the Florida Panthers. They'll never, never admit that publicly, obviously, but that's the only thing I can read into having Ryan Reese play over 10 minutes. Like, I thought he was great. I thought he was good, but there's no way in my world that Matthew Nyes plays 657 and Ryan Reese plays 10 more minutes than Matthew Nyes, who's been a bona fide top six skater on this team, had a goal and an assist, uh, it wasn't a fight. It was a roughing penalty. But uh, you just read the box score after and you watch the game sometimes. And you're like, what's going on? But I've got no problem with putting guys in different uh, positions of success and strength and leverage and all that. You, you know, bottom line, if you're Sheldon Keefe, you're probably looking at these games a bit differently than we are, right? You're getting this team prepped for the Stanley Cup playoffs, at least you hope. Yeah, and that's, you know, and it's funny. Last week, you know, we were sitting here talking about, I wasn't talking about, but the narrative was, well, you know, are the Maple Leafs going to fall into a wild card position? And they solidified that they're probably going to finish in the top three, you know, as they're four points behind Florida and have a four point, sorry, six point cushion on the Tampa Bay Lightning. So, you know, I'm just looking at it if it was on the opposite side saying, well, they're struggling, uh, they're overplaying. Remember, that was that was the, the conversation in years past. Well, why is Matthews and Marner, why are they at 25 minutes? Why are they at 26 minutes? Why are they penalty killing? Why are they playing so much? Because they didn't have that depth. So I think what they're trying to do and what Keep is trying to do is really see and, and test the strength of depth that they have because they're going to rely on these guys going back to the conversation that it can't be a two line in a 4D team. So I'm all for it. You can experiment with different things. And uh, back to the nice thing, you know, sometimes the coaches, they lose track. They lose track of ice time. They lose track of their specialty teams and stuff like that too. So I think that's a one-off where you're going to see him getting up probably to 13, 14, 15 minutes come playoff time. But that Reeves line, you know, they were very, very effective. And I think the key is, is that accountability giving guys an opportunity because that was sort of what happened uh, before where no matter how good or bad you did, the fourth line was they're playing their four or five minutes. The top guys are playing their top line minutes. That accountability is there too. And they're throwing guys a bone. So I don't mind that uh, while you're experimenting, getting ready for the playoffs. Uh, just like you, I look at games and segments. I know you look at five game segments. I look at two period segments and that's probably the way I'd break down this game. The first two periods, the first 40 minutes were, were outstanding. I, I thought that the least played with jam. They played with pace, desperation. They're always the first team of the puck. You know, I started to wonder, I tweeted at you if the Florida Panthers got the green light special on Easter Sunday on King West, like it had the industry night feel to them, but I, I think the Leafs deserved a lot of credit. Um, I think it started early. Matthew Nyes, the response off the Holmberg hit by by Mikola. Like, that's what you want to see, specifically from a young kid, really, really stepped up. And I think that type of play is contagious. Like, um, you know, the Leafs looked like the aggressor in the first two periods, which I love to see, especially against the Florida Panthers. Yeah, going back to the game against Boston, you know, they're saying they're the reason why they went out and had to get a Pat Maroon and, Normally they're on the opposite end and the receiving end of, you know, the, the pugilism. And it's good to see Nyes, who's a rookie stepping in. And that Mikola is not a big, a small guy. He's six foot five. So uh, yeah, you want to maybe work on getting the gloves off there and throwing maybe a little chicken nuggets there, maybe. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> again, he's, he's, the, I like the fact that he did something because in years past, you know, in a situation like that, guys are looking for their wallet or looking for an exit, maybe, uh, you know, to, to get out of the game. So that's part of a team coming together where you can see they have that camaraderie. Um, it's not necessarily about fighting. It's just stepping up, letting that team know we're not going to be pushed around. So uh, I know Gudis isn't here this year for the Florida Panthers, but I think Florida is not uh, prey. Sorry, the Leafs aren't prey in any sense of the word where they're going to be predator. And they showed that when push comes to shove to a man, they're stepping up and ready to protect themselves and their team. Teammates. Another player I really had a microscope on last night, and we talked about this uh, on yesterday's show, was Nick Robertson. And then you score a goal like that. You kick off the scoring four goals in the past nine games since the AHL recall now up to 12 in the season. What does he need to do? Cause I, I don't know about you. Look, I'm still undecided assuming full health guys like Yarn Croak and others are back in the mix for this team. I'm still unsure if Nick Robertson cracks my game one roster. Now mind you, it's not all about the first game adjustments will be made. Lineup changes will be made, but where do you stand on Nick Robertson? Because for, to me, like the only way to stand out in games like that where this guy's not going to be physical, it's just not his style, his brand, his game, and he's not great enough defensively, you need to stand out, in my opinion, scoring. And I think if you continue to score against teams like Florida and specifically in a series, you leave no choice but to have the coach leave you in the lineup, right? 
he's been playing some great hockey. And I think I've been one of the biggest advocates for him where, you know, I, I said this, I think a few years ago, give Nick Robertson 30 games, put him in the top six, give him 14 minutes and we'll have an evaluation exactly what you have. And here's a player now for the last two, three years has been trying to make his way and get over the hump and being a consistent member. And, you know, it's been sometimes due to play, sometimes due to injuries or cap implications where he has to go down to the minors. But for him, if you just go out and leave him alone, he's one of those guys that sort of figures it out. And when you're ready to write him off, he finds a way uh, just to score a goal or put together a couple of great segments where he's putting up legitimate numbers. So, um, you know, I tweeted it yesterday. I said, you know, leave him in the lineup forever because, you know, going back to my, my, my sentiment about who's going to score that big goal, you know, did you see that speed that he had on that goal? He had that separation and that's a goal scores goal. And, you know, if I'm the coaching staff, you know, you're not just learning that now you're seeing that every day in practice. You're seeing that every day uh, on the road and uh, you know, throughout the whole entire year. So I think for him is one of those guys, just let him cook, give him the rock, let him cook. And if you're worried about his struggles or his inabilities, I think it's your job as a coaching staff to surround him with guys that are going to turn his weaknesses into his strength. So put him with a defensive minder center to put him with the defense pairing that is going to really focus on getting the pucks out. So for him, it's a speed game. Uh, he can score off the rush. Uh, yes, I'd like to see him maybe, um, you know, handle the pucks a little bit better off the cycle or in on the four check, but off the rush, off the fly, he's a top four player on this team. And I think it's up to the team to surround him with guys that are going to sort of insulate uh, his weaknesses. But um, again, just imagine now if he was playing some legitimate power play time consistently, they weren't messing with his minutes. They weren't sending him down. You have a 20 goal goal scorer. And in this team with the cap, problems that they have you need guys in entry level you need cheap guys that can outperform their their salary cap hit and he's one of those guys i think if you just let him cook a little bit more you're going to have a little bit of a better product for sure do you think there's a staying power for that nice holmberg robertson line like they combined for two goals and three assists i don't know if they have what it takes to be a shutdown line in the stanley cup playoffs they're certainly not a fourth line they're not a second line they're not a first line like Again, I put zero stock in a Sheldon Keefe's lines because he changes them so frequently. But do you think that type of line, that trio, has staying power? Well, home, I mean, Nice does have five points in his last five games, but it depends. I think it depends on what Austin Matthews wants, right? And you can talk about Nice's sure. numbers and, and and what they may or way that what they may not be. I think he's had an excellent season for coming in as a rookie, but. You know, he's a big, big component of Matthews, you know, sitting at 62 goals right now. So whether it's luck, whether it's him getting in on the puck, but I think it's just him adding another big body that can get in and turn pucks over. You know, it, it's tough to argue that he shouldn't be playing with Austin Matthews come playoffs. So it's going to depend on Marner when he gets back too. But those three, I think, had the most chemistry. It's good seeing Matthews now with Domi and, um, and, uh, and, and Bertuzzi. You know, they're getting a little bit of chemistry as well too, but you need to have different, uh, you know, different looks. But when Nyes was playing with Matthews, Matthews was, you know, putting those pucks in consistently. So um, it's a good problem to have. Uh, but I think what's great now is, you know, you're looking up and down that lineup. It's not just three, four guys that are, are consistently showing up. You're having eight, nine, ten forwards every night show up consistently. And that's a key uh, to a team making a playoff run. Talk about keys, man. Like the ultimate X factor is Austin Matthews. Like, it really is crazy, and um, I think when you look at this guy, you sort of take him for granted because he scores every game and seemingly on every shot, but two more goals now, two empty net goals in the season, which I kind of, you know, the guy deserves it. When you score 60 times, just, uh, you know, two more goals to, to, to go to 62 that are empty netters, like, it's so cool. But I was watching that game, and I'm, like, thinking about load management and rest. Like, where do you sit in that conversation? Because... 70 would be great, and the pace is 69 nice right now. But ultimately, I want Austin Matthews feeling his best the most important time of the season. Do you think that's a conversation they're having behind the scenes as to what to do right now? I think it is, but you know, I'm of the opinion when you sit back and you sit out and you're worried about injuries and worrying about you know bubble wrapping guys, that's when they get hurt. So I think for him, um, he hasn't played a lot of heavy minutes this year. Um, you know, he has blocked a lot of shots, but you don't see him jumping in face first, like, you know, Tortorella esque. So it's, it's just, it's funny, you know, you're, you're seeing him play. It's like, he's almost in cruise control out there the way that he can control the play. He knows when to turn it off. He knows when to turn it off and on, uh, and he can control the game at his own pace. So I think for him, yeah, you have that conversation with him, but 
you know, 70 goals. That's, you know, now you're talking about all time status there too. Not many guys have done that consistently. So for me, I, I have a conversation with him, but what you don't now, you sit him out for two, three games. And then now if he doesn't score in the first two playoff games, oh, you know, Kawhi Leonard load management. <laughs> and we're sitting here talking about this the whole entire summer when I'm trying to be resting, you know, at Shirkston Shores. So uh, I think it, 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 it's a bit of a balance. Uh, but for me, I want to see him play. Um, I, I, I really feel you keep momentum by playing and practicing. If you're going to load management, do it in practice, give them some off days, um, maybe have them just come to the rink and kick a soccer ball. But for sitting out games, I think you're going to lose that edge. If you're sitting out for two, three, yes, you want him ready for the playoffs, but him sitting out, I think is going to take that edge that he, he has right now. I'll tell you right now, they got a back to back the 16th and 17th to finish up the regular season. Austin Matthews is not playing that back to back. Um, I understand he's going for something that hasn't been done in, whatever 30 plus years and it's a pretty crazy number and i think mario is the last guy 31 years ago to score you know 65 in a season i think it's fine and dandy but last time i checked nobody cares about the personal milestones anymore i think this is a great story don't get me wrong austin matthews fantastic best goal score potentially of all time here but you have to have the greater good of of like what what the future looks like in sight and there's no way i want to play a back-to-back -back. you don't think florida's going to gun for this guy if they're playing him or have the potential of playing him like the last couple games when they got their goons in the lineup like no no thanks not with ryan reeves out there but again if he scores 70 you're gonna have a, a math am 34 70 t-shirt you're gonna have a hat you're gonna have a headband you're gonna be carrying a do flag you, do you even see me at scotia bank arena do you think i'm gonna buy a fucking 600 dollar t-shirt off the website you Unlikely. are going to be you're gonna have the mustache so just think no of shot. the 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 headlines and the money that that generates. So I think it's an important milestone because you're chasing history and we're sitting here debating, you know, him amongst the greats already. Uh, and I think that just puts him in a whole other stratosphere. And I, I don't think there's enough respect put on Austin Matthews name for what he does. We were having the debate somewhere. Does he have enough assists? I'm like, who gives a shit? Does Babe Ruth, <laughs> does Babe Ruth, you know, did he steal enough bases? Who cares? He just, all he does is hit dingers. So um, I, I think him, when he gets 70, he finally gets that respect and do that he's lacking. I think he doesn't care. I think he doesn't really care about that. He's got a lot of money in the bank and, um, you know, he's, he's well respected amongst his peers in the media here, but I think on a league wide basis, it now, um, shortens and, and closes the conversation with the McKinnons and, and then, and the, um, the, the McDavid's and the dry sidles because he, he I believe he's in that same conversation, but this solidifies that if he scores 70. The enough uh, assist conversations came out of Edmonton because Connor McDavid's a freak of, of nature. And don't forget, Austin Matthews is like 40 more goals than Connor McDavid, who won the Rock of Richard last year. Like, this guy is on a different playing field. Austin Matthews, there's no one close to this guy scoring goals. Not even Mr. Privilege, Zach Hyman. I'm sorry to say it. <laughs> not even David Pasternak. Yeah, Matthews and I and like I read a... And I read yeah. a great uh, stat yesterday. Um, it said that Austin Matthews has more goals than anybody since the 2010 draft. And he wasn't drafted until 2016. So like the Jeff Skinners and the Pat, all these guys that were drafted six years before him, he has more goals than. So that when you put that in perspective and there's some great goal scorers since that draft, uh, it's just tough because there are other superstars in the league and Kucherov and Dreisaitl and McDavid and McKinnon. But you know, I'm going back to my days. If you were a 35 goal guy or a 40 goal guy, like you can do whatever you want. You are a rock star. So I can't even fathom. I couldn't even imagine, you know, how I'd be acting if I was a 55, 60, 70 goal scorer. Nobody would be able to tell me anything. So the fact that he's still performing and, and even, you know, showing up on a nightly basis where he is a rock star, that just shows what type of person he is and leader as well. Yeah, I have first-hand accounts. This guy ain't waiting in any lines on King Street West. Uh, rest assured, just having a dynamite year is Austin Matthews. But it's sort of become par for the course where it's like he scores, he scores, and I don't even respond anymore. Like, it's it's so amazing. Um, imagine being that guy's teammate. And, and, and this isn't disrespect to Connor McDavid, who's on pace to get over 100 assists and could win another Art Ross trophy, could win another Hart trophy. But, like, it's hard to score in this league. You played in this league. Like, you know, just look at the numbers we're breaking down. The fact that this hasn't been done in 30 plus years of scoring this many goals. And, and now he's beating his personal record. He's hunting down Ovechkin's uh, season best. Like these are like legendary numbers. And again, I find myself pinching myself on a nightly basis, trying to put myself in the moment. 
of what I'm watching, right? Where I think he he has conditioned my brain every time he scores, it's like no response anymore. But like it shouldn't be this easy to score goals in the NHL. It's crazy to me, man. Yeah, it's funny. And again, there's a lot of traditionalists, especially in this market. And when having the conversation on who the greatest Maple Leaf of all time, they want to mention Matthews, but out of respect to some of the other legends, all oh, these guys won a Stanley Cup or this guy won six in 1947. Yeah. They don't really put that respect on his name, but they know it's just a matter of time before they, it's undeniable. And I think you could say now he is the greatest leaf of all time. And for me, I personally believe it's Matt Sundin and what he did at carrying that team for that many years, not really having the support. Matthews is light years ahead of him. So again, it's just think of all the superstars throughout the league in the last 30 years, the Koreas, the Lindros, the Pavel Burres, the Kovalchuk's guys that scored 50 goal, like, He's outclassing these guys. So it's, you know, for me, when I was a, I was a goal scorer at, at most levels other than the NHL, to have an appreciation for that and make me a fan, that's what he does. He's making his teammates and people around the league that are in the league watching him a fan. So, again, if I played against him, I'd be asking for a stick and, and maybe yeah. you can sign it or I'd be trying to switch my curve or, you know, maybe grow my muzzy like his as well too because <laughs> that guy is – he's a rock star. He's a superstar and there's not enough adjectives – um, to really describe what he's doing and doing consistently since he's come in the league. Like he's on pace. We're talking about Ovechkin breaking the record. And yes, he's been very, very, um, you know, had great longevity and, you know, he's been scoring consistently, but Matthews is on a better clip than him. So I know it's early. Yes. But we're going to be talking about him going down as the greatest American goal scorer, at least a lot sooner than later. If this guy gets to 69 goals, Sheldon Keefe, just do the right thing. <laughs> shut, shut him down. Oh, he ain't, so you there's no nice. way. So you can tweet nice for the next two weeks and be, after you say make a trade. I, I, well, I know your tricks. I know your tricks. <laughs> it's merch madness. We, oh, we could man. make a nice shirt. We can't include Austin Matthews' face, but I could put nice on a T-shirt oh, and we could fucking funny. sell the shit out of that thing. I'm just thinking I'd about the it. company. I'm a company guy, Stu. I'd buy it. I'd buy it. There you go. There you go. You know what I'm buying is this PK, dude, because uh, special teams has been a uh, pretty prolific story the last little while. Maybe I'm un unlike most people. I don't put much stock into the struggling power play with the due respect to Connor Timmons. Uh, he will never be running probably an NHL power play again, never mind the least power play. But again, there are so many options out of the mix, namely Riley, namely Lilligren. Um, so an 0 for 15 skid on the PP or 0 for 16, but they've, they've killed 15 straight penalties. And, and I think that's got to be viewed as a positive. Some, still some guys out like Marner and, and yarn croak. And, and that's the bigger story for me is getting the PK right. As opposed to the power play going, how do you feel about it? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And bringing in Dewar, I think that, um, you know, he's, he's a specialist in Minnesota. He's a guy that stepped up and showed that he could do it too. But I think they're getting a lot more guys and variety, giving guys an opportunity. And I think that's the key to a good penalty kill, not just having set lines, creating a competition, right? And when guys are working hard to block shots and, um, you know, create that competition, I think is really, really good. But I think the one thing with this power penalty kill in the last little bit is just, I don't think they're sitting back a little bit more. They're a lot more aggressive. They're recovering a lot better to the middle. They're blocking shots. They're getting in lanes um, and they're not turning the puck over and they're getting pucks out. So I think that's um, a sign that this team is evolving a little bit where sometimes they just make that, that fumble or they lose it or that penalty is, you know, scored at the inopportune time. They're just finding a way to pay attention to those details, getting pucks out, getting in lanes, those basics. So uh, the good part is they're, they're doing it and they're peaking at the right time going into playoffs, because if you want to win a bunch of rounds, um, not just your power play, your penalty kill has to be equally as strong. Your specialty teams have to be special. That's the one line I remember hearing from my coaches. Special teams have to be special. So it's a good, good issue. Uh, but um, don't say, well, Marner's out. That's why, it's, again, he is a top penalty killer, I think, amongst the league as well, and they're going to welcome him back with open arms on the power play and uh, rightfully so on the penalty kill as well. Leaf Nation 67 wrote in a couple questions. Uh, the one that sticks out is Mitch Marner, where you put him in, and I wanted to ask you about that because I really like what I'm seeing from that top line with Domi, uh, Bertuzzi, and, and Matthews. Like, I wouldn't deviate from that right now. Again, I put zero stock into the line combinations, but there's no way in hell, assuming Marner could even come back as early as Wednesday against Tampa. Where, where does he fit on your roster? It wouldn't be on that top line for me right now. I, I say it's back on the top line. And, okay. and again, Fair. I think yeah. you bring back Nyes, but I think the key is adding that depth. So if you're hiding a Bertuzzi or a Domi on that third line, 
you know, we talked about uh, the Holmberg Robertson Nyes line not really having, you know, you know, the defensive uh, effectiveness against other teams. If you have a Domi or a Bertuzzi or even a, a John Tavares down there, remember he was peaking a little bit down there as well, too, adding mm-hmm. that balance. Now you have three strong lines that you can pretty much put out against anybody there, too. So uh, Marner, you know, we're not sure what the injury is. I know it's what high ankle sprain, possibly. It's going to take some time. What was that on Friday, by the way? <laughs> Stop talking about it. That's why I'm not talking about it. But anyway, <laughs> you know, touche. Imagine that he comes in here on this show. What are you guys talking about? And then he just hangs up. Uh, but anyways, uh, having those three strong lines, I think, is key. And and what's great now is putting Bertuzzi and Domi out. That's woken them up a little bit too. Now I think if they go back down, their game is rounded off a bit, where they're still going to be productive as well too. So it's a good problem to have because usually at this time of year we're talking about well. Is two lines or four players going to be enough to get it done? You have legitimate nine, ten forwards that on any given night are doing something consistently. It's a great problem to have. If I'm Sheldon Keith, I'm not worrying too much about it. You can still tinker with things. But again, it comes down to Austin Matthews. Who do you want to play with? I'm sure he's going to say, I want to, I want Chubbs and Crockett for my Miami Vice line. <laughs> Fair. Um, I think the biggest positive, uh, I, I – I respectfully disagree. I would keep that top line together with Domi and Bertuzzi, but I would add the caveat that like the, the best positive news, you have Domi playing like a rock star and you have Bertuzzi playing like a rock star right now. Like it, it really, and I, I, I tweet out joking shit all the time. Like I think it's hilarious three months ago, all the tweets like Bertuzzi is a terrible fit and Domi's a terrible fit. Like these guys are playing with so much confidence right now. It's crazy to suggest Tyler Bertuzzi needs one goal for 20. He has 13 goals in the past 21 games. The drop passes, the breakaways for Domi. Like, these guys are playing to their game to a T. And we've talked about this all season long, almost ad nauseum on this show, how you want to get these guys going at the at the right time. Well, Stewie, it's, it's almost the right time. We have eight games remaining in the season, and they're playing their best hockey. You love to see it. Yeah, they both are. And, again, you notice them every shift. And I want to know the analytics – on Bertuzzi and the numbers since he put that neck guard on what his numbers are. Cause it's, 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 I think he's got the most points per True. neck guard uh, in, yeah. in the league. So um, that's why they were brought in. Right. And remember, these guys have a lot of motivation. They obviously they want to win, but financial motivations where if they come in and do what they need to do, they're going to sign a long-term contract either here or somewhere else. So I think them, you know, peaking at this time was part of the plan because they want to, you know, obviously make some money. But I think right now is some of these injuries throughout the year have forced Sheldon Keefe. Uh, he is a creature of habit and he likes to stick with what he wants, what he has, but is forcing him now to mix the lines and juggle the lines and try some new things out. And I think for Bertuzzi and Domi, if he's with Mar- uh, with Matthews in the playoffs and game one, there's zeros across the board. They don't have shots. We're going to be sitting here. Oh, they need to switch things up, get Marner. Could you imagine if Marner was on the third line? Could you imagine what would happen in this market? I think the uh, CN Tower would topple over if that was the case. So, um, yes, he's a creature of habit, but you got to tinker with things too and go with what works. And I'm, it's worked most consistently. Matthew's playing with Marner, and I'm sure that's what he wants, and that's what Poppy gets, what he wants, and that's why he signed here for the big, big bucks long term. Speaking of which, uh, Relliot writes in, does anyone love King Street West more than Nick Alberta? Nope. Never heard that last next name question. pronounced that next way. Next question. <laughs> yeah, next question. You are <laughs> you are correct on that front. I know some of you are still writing in, where's O, where's O? Um, I'm sure you missed the uh, top of the show. We're not going to get Jeff O'Neill on today. I think down the road we're going to try again, just something. There's a conflict that came up, so our apologies on that front. But again, we... Uh, Always talking Leafs here on Leafs Morning Take at the Leafs Nation 401, where you can subscribe, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Uh, Ilya Samsonov, the crease. Um, I think that's an engaging conversation to have as well. And I'd love for you to peel back the curtain on a goal scorer's mentality. At the very least, to be able to score five goals and and chase a Sergei Bobrovsky could only be a positive in my world, considering what happened last spring, right? Yeah, we're talking about Samsonov, right? Or Bobrovsky? Well, no, we could talk about the goaltending. I, w- I would like to start with Bobrovsky, get to Samsonov after. Um, yeah, but again, we know Bobrovsky. He's the he's the king of hot and cold, right? I sure. could see him, hey, you know what? I'm going to change the narrative a little bit here. I'm going to come in and let in five, and then I'm going to stop them in the playoffs. <laughs> so who knows what's going on with him? But he is... Uh, he's been a little bit more consistent this year too, but remember last year he was chased from the crease a bunch of games last year, and he had to come in and relief actually last year in playoffs, I believe. So was that mm-hmm. not the case? So I think yeah. the key for him is getting on him early 
Uh, he's one of those game goalies when he lets in a goal early, it sort of, you know, puts him on his toes and um, just putting as many pucks on net as possible because he's some of those go, some of those long shots, he fumbles or he loses tracks of rebounds or some pucks get caught behind him. So I think the key is if I'm playing against Bobrovsky, I want to have 12, 15 shots that first period because you can be up two, three, uh, nothing as well too. He's not that great on breakaways as we could see on Robertson, you know, <laughs> Deking him out of his jock, but let's not uh, mince words here. You know, he's been an elite goaltender this year, uh, but I think for the playoffs, you know, you know, taking a little bit of a dent out of him, putting up five, one was empty net, uh, making it six, I think is really good for the confidence uh, for the Maple Leafs if that's going to be their round one opponent. So if I'm them, just continue to pepper him, get in his head, find a way to get on him early. I think that's the key to beating Bobrovsky and the Florida Panthers if it's a seven-game series. Confidence builder for sure. Uh, what did you make of Ilya Samsonov's night? Um, I, I I think he's been such a tremendous story since being recalled in, in early January. And I still think there's some runway for Joseph Wall to get back in the conversation. I think in general, we're making too much of this combo about who starts game one. You just talked about Florida. It was Alex Lyons, Kreese, and Sergei Bobrovsky went on a crazy run. Mark my words, we're going to see both Bobrovsky, or excuse me, both Samsonov and Joseph Wall at least. I mean, you never know with the crease. You're going to see both guys in the Stanley Cup playoffs. I'm saying that right now. Are you going to venture out and say we're going to see Martin Jones as well? No. You just or never Matt know. Murray? Or Matt Dude, Murray? Okay, guys, I'm not trying to... <laughs> these, these guys drop like fucking flies. I, I've been saying this. We need a summit. We need something. Like, oh, even watching man. last night, it seems like every second game, Elias Samsonov is, like, diving down. And you're, you you don't know if the guy's going to get up. Like, and, and, and it's not just him. It's around the league. It's a different mentality. I think these guys are babied a bit more in this day and age. Like, I remember back in the day, I knew Curtis Joseph was starting every game. I knew Marty Berdur was going to be out there every game. Uh, there's always a slight hesitation if this guy's going to be at the morning skate. Is he going to slip? Is he going to play? That's just how I feel. And that's why you need insurance. That's why they got Martin Jones. So, I guess that's why they got <laughs> that Matt Murray's still in the mix. You just never know what's going to happen. But I think they're going to need both guys. Sammy's been great. I, I thought he was awesome against Buffalo. I thought he uh, hung in there. There was some flurries where Florida was just exceptional. Like, I think they realized, oh, we're playing a hockey game against a team we've thoroughly dominated in the past. And Sammy made some big-time stops, including that big one, what was it, five, six minutes in on Sam Reinhart. Yeah, and I think he got hung out to dry a little bit uh, in the third period, and that was by design yeah. just based on the personnel that was out there. But he made some big, big saves, uh, you know, in that first and second period. And, you know, I think the, the the book out on on Samsonov is when he doesn't have that competition, when he's not worried about his job security, I think that's when he performs the best. And you can see, you know, when Wall went down, he had the crease. And, yeah, Martin Jones came in relief a couple times too, but he was the go-to guy. But in today's NHL, you can't just have a go-to guy. I played with Roberto Luongo. I think he played 76 games one year yeah. uh, for Florida. But those guys are a different breed. Those guys like can just put their gear on, get on the ice, and not worry about any injuries whatsoever. They're like rubber mans. Uh, but for Samsonov, I think they're going to need him uh, down the stretch. I think it's his crease to lose. I've obviously seen the reports on that. And he's got the confidence of his teammates. Um, you know, you see the headlines afterwards and the teammates talking about them. They have confidence in him as well. So I think the fact that he's uh, um, anointed number one, I think that helps his game. Yeah. But again, if you're talking about going two, three rounds here, there's going to be some falters. There are going to be some stumbles and there's going to be some competition for that crease and wool. I think would have a couple more starts. Now, if he finally got over that hump before the injury, but he was just a couple more games and wins and big starts away from that too. But I'm sure he's going to get another opportunity. And the good thing is when you have two guys that are going performing well, it brings up the overall um, competition and quality of play between the pipes for this team. Home against Tampa on Wednesday. I go to Wall. How about you? Uh, yeah, Tampa's struggling a little bit too. It's not uh, a must-win game uh, for Toronto in any sense of the word. And yes, Samsonov, it's his crease, but give him a little bit of a break. I don't mind resting the goaltenders. We talked about Austin Matthews and, and getting a break. We're coming down that final stretch. I'd like to see Wall get a bunch of starts. So that leads me to the next series of questions as we continue along here on Least Morning Take, the Tuesday edition. So suddenly the Leafs are four points back for second in this division. Um, home ice to me doesn't matter unless the games are in Buffalo. But last time I checked yesterday was April Fools and the video we put out on the Leafs Nation YouTube page didn't go over very well, specifically in Buffalo. And and two, like I, I think it's just it's 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 probably easier to win on the road and the Leafs have had a lot of success. So 
I don't care as much about that. I probably care more about the first round opponent, but where do you stand on those two questions? Do you care about the first round opponent? Do you care about home ice in round one? No, you're going to have to beat a Boston and Florida uh, eventually. So it doesn't matter if I'm the Maple Leafs, but I, I prefer being on the road. Right. And, um, yeah. you know, I had the opportunity to be with the LA Kings uh, when they were on the road in 2012, 13, I think when they lost to Chicago in the second round. And it's just a lot less pressure. You don't have to worry about tickets. You don't have to worry about family coming in and, and, and it's one less headache. And when you're on the road, it's just the camaraderie. You're doing your video in the meal room. Um, you know, you have your fillets. You don't go anywhere. You just have, it's almost like you're just hunkered down in this bunker getting prepared for this game. So yes, there's some extra pressure being on the road and all that, but again, just relaxing, being around the boys and just focusing on hockey. I think that's the key to, to winning. So for me as a player, when I'm playing at home, I got family, I got tickets, I got, I got to take the dog for a walk. You can sort of, <laughs> leave your responsibilities <laughs> other than paying for everything in the NHL uh, on the, you know, at home. So if I'm Toronto, I want to get on the road and remember less media too. Right. So you don't have to deal with, Hey, what happened in the second period? You know, you can take a couple of days off before you answer that question. So I'm a big proponent of being on the road. What do you mean? They don't pipe in Leafs morning take into the locker room, even on the road. They must. <laughs> you don't even want to hear this one. I guess uh, when I was on one of the big networks, um, we had a live, our mics were live fed into the dressing oh, room. Shit. So let's just say some guys were seeing some very unpleasant trees about the team that was listening. Oh, fuck. And we got a memo from the league saying, ah, just letting you know that they can hear what you guys are saying. I'm like, ah, oh, man. <laughs> I have amnesia. I have no clue where you work before you join this show. Yeah, I think it was on the BET network. I think that's. Yes. It was. <laughs> no, it's exactly. Uh, Jay Figs writes in. Um, big fan of, of Stewie. Like you're one of his favorite world junior players ever, man. That's kind of cool. Like, I know you got the background there and yeah, Stewie, yeah, one no, of my that's favorite great. Canada juniors yeah. ever. Yeah. That was my, uh, the heyday in, of my career. And I'll tell a quick story yeah. about that was, um, you know, seeing, uh, Sidney Crosby the first year versus the second year, like the first year, you know, there's a picture of me, you know, holding my arm around and be like, Hey man, don't worry. You're not getting a lot of ice. Everything's going to be okay, kid. And then the next year he just turns into this superstar. There's like a picture of his arm around me saying, Hey Stu, I know you're not playing this much this year, but, uh, so just seeing the evolution of Sidney Crosby going from Sid, the kid is the best player in the hockey world in the world, but and he wasn't even drafted to the NHL yet. That was amazing to see that. You see Kyle Dubas show up on Twitter last night? Oh, yeah. What did he say? Oh, he did. Are you you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Yeah, I saw that meme. That's a, that was a great meme. He pops up once in a while. It's great to see that. It's great to see it, that. It was something about like 19 straight point per game seasons for Sidney Crosby. And uh, I think Evolving Wild or something like that on Twitter, like uh, it's an analytics account, was talking about, oh, I wonder. I don't even know what the wording was, but like maybe they bench him for the rest of the season or something like that. Yeah, and and yeah. it prompted a Kyle Dubas tweet. So, I wonder if he uh, saw my my tweet last year where I said Kyle Dubas appreciation tweet. That's funny. I was at a luncheon uh, yesterday and I was sitting with an executive from the Maple Leafs and a uh, former media member. And they threw me under the bus right in front of the members saying, hey, why don't you tell them what you said about uh, Dubas being the brainchild of Pittsburgh? And I'm like, ah, I didn't really say that. So they put me right on the spot in front of the Maple Leafs. And I'm like. Yeah, I basically just said that, you know, he's got seven years and, you know, he's got a really good background in scouting. I said something to try to, you know, take the heat off and be right in front of it. Because sometimes, like you, I dread the day you face Islander fans because they're coming for you. And I was put in that moment. It's very, very uncomfortable to say the least. It's uh, it's coming up in a couple of years. They'll host the uh, NHL All-Star Weekend and I'll be there. And the funny thing is, like, I mean, you were at a party with me in Florida. Like you saw who was in that that group, in that bottle service group. I mean, <laughs> there was attachment to that organization. So sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you make amends and maybe you make amends uh, with some of the folks in the Leafs organization. But it is a, a tough part of the job, I would say, for somebody especially like you who played the game, right? And have to be critical and have to be an analyst and are a prolific name on TV and radio. Like it's part of the job though. And I think the players realize that now. Yeah, they do. And I've had some former teammates and, and people call me literally when they're supposed to be on the ice for practice or getting ready for a game. And, you know, asking me about my opinion. And I say, guys, like, this is my job now. And yeah. I said, what are you really going to say differently in my position and still have a job? So yeah, sometimes you got to be critical, but again, I say it from my perspective, uh, from my experience as a player, as elite player, younger growing up. And again, do I value my opinion that much where I'm going to be debating you for, you know, 10 hours on Twitter or X? No, that's my opinion. If you don't agree with it, that's fine as well. 
Fair enough. Uh, I love that saying. Uh, the following segment is brought to you by Douglas, by the way. Good friends of Douglas uh, sent me a brand new king size mattress and I'm getting my bed frame. This thing's going to be set up in the next 24 to 48 hours. I'm going to have the best sleep of my life. So a full review coming your way. But name Canada's best mattress on Canadian living. Douglas is loved by more than 200,000 Canadians and they're backed by over 10,000 five star reviews. Every mattress order comes with a free comfort sleep bundle, two memory foam pillows with pillow protectors, one luxurious cotton sheet set and one mattress protector. Order today at douglas.ca slash LMT. That's douglas.ca slash LMT. Um, some news and notes on the farm. Easton Cowan. Like, we can't even recall the last time this guy didn't register a point in a hockey game. Now into the uh, the, the playoffs there in the OHL, the London Knights up uh, 2 nothing in their series against Flint. But uh, Easton Cowan nominated for the OHL's Red Tilson Trophy, given to the league's regular season MVP, which I think is kind of goofy, but that's just my opinion. One of 20 nominees for that award, and uh, he's currently riding a 38-game point streak regular season and playoffs. So 20 nominees, Easton Cowan in that conversation, and uh, we'll see what happens. I guess it's sort of like the Hart Trophy of the OHL, right? Yes, and Leaf fans. And when's the last time you've been that excited for a young player coming Amazing. in? Probably Matthew Nice, right, yeah. or her Robertson. But, yeah. you know, him and Fraser Minton coming in, and that's going to be the key now bringing in young, cheap guys that can perform. So, you know, there were a lot of people at the draft questioning that pick. Oh, who is this guy? London Knight, what's the connection there? But no one's questioning that now. And, no. um, you know, you see me wearing an Erie Otters hat as one of the young players on the team I personally mentor is playing uh, the Kitchener Rangers right now. And if they win, you know, I'm going to tell him to say his goodbyes because they're probably not beating the London Knights. So I love Erie. <laughs> I support them to the death of me. But that London Knights team is on a whole different level. And it's good to see Cowan. Uh, perform well under the uh, the bright lights of London and the Toronto Maple Leafs a lot sooner than later. Man, Erie's a sneaky program too. I remember covering junior back in the day, McDavid, Dylan Strom, Alex Dabrinkit. Like there's some really, really strong players clearly that went through that market. And it's like not a market that's talked about a lot, but like they've done some great things in Erie. But yeah, I, I've mentioned this on the podcast before. I know there's a variety of you who listen and watch that are actually based in London or went to Fanshawe, went to, to Western. I thought that was a unique experience of going to school in a market like London was being able to cover the London Knights. And you want to be a rock star, go play for the London Knights. But I could only wonder uh, how Easton Cowan is perceived in that city, the season that guy's having. And you talked about it. I remember it specifically. I was at the draft in Nashville. You were there too, no? Uh, I was at my draft in Nashville, 2003. We're talking okay, about that. So yeah. The, the draft in Nashville <laughs> this past June, talking to a couple people like, I don't know about that pick for the Leafs. And I know it's not even a year removed and it's like, shit, this guy's having a pretty damn good year where you sort of see a pathway. If he has a good camp, you never know come the fall. Yeah, we might be talking about it on this show. Is he going to be playing yeah. with Matthews or where he's going to be playing and who's getting put on waivers? But uh, go back back to that London program. Mm. Um, you know, I was recently at the OHL Cup, as we talked about at the beginning of the show, and I saw Danny Savret and Adam Dennis, who were on that championship yeah. winning team. And those guys are all still legends in London. They don't have to pay for a beer or do any. These guys are legends. So whether they went on to, you know, play a thousand games or they only played five games in the NHL, when they go back to London, the fans... Uh, the city treat them like royalty. So um, the, the saying goes, yes, there's a lot of beers to be had in London and those oh. guys don't have to pay for one. <laughs> yeah. Put it this way. I had a buddy who was like the goalie on the London Knights uh, when John Tavares was there too. And he just told me some stories where it's like, man, we ain't, we ain't paying for anything in this city. It's like comparable to being on the Toronto Maple Leafs. It really, really is cool. And imagine playing junior hockey there and, and knowing that that barn's going to be packed on a Friday night it was called the John Labatt Center when I was there back when. Uh, but just to, to play in front of that many people, I think, sets you up for success. And that's the best part about this from Easton Cowan's perspective is he's used to the limelight already, looking forward to the fall. Um, shouldn't lo lose sight of the fact, too, that the Leafs signed an NCAA player on Monday night, a defensive forward named Jacob Quillen, a two-year ELC. He's 22 from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, played for Quin Quinnipiac this season. And uh, talking to a couple people, including Stephen Ellis from Daily Faceoff, gave me a bit of a 411. Said he's a big fan, uh, projected to be a steady bottom six NHLer for a long time, maybe as early as next season. Works his ass off, a good 200 foot player. So 
another guy to throw into the mix in, in training camp next year. You can't have enough of these guys, right? Yeah, and he he picked the, the perfect market because the headline is he's the guy that uh, knocked out uh, – Matthew Nyes in the frozen nice. floor last year. So yeah. <laughs> great. Welcome to the city kid. But uh, again, that's, that just shows, you know, what type of uh, organization the Maple Leafs are, where they can, att- they can attract top guys. He wasn't drafted, right? He was signed. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so that shows again, here's a guy now that is choosing Toronto, you know, and there could be a potential log jam up front with some young guys coming up in Minton and Cowan too. So that just shows, um, you know, that the future is bright in Toronto. Uh, and there's some young guys that are ready to come up. But for me personally, I want to see the the Robertson get, give him his 17 minutes. And I, I'm telling you now, Holmberg, you know, playing his, you know, consistently third line, not messing with his eyes. He's a 20, he's a 20 goal guy. He could be Johansson. He could be a Kapanen. And again, I'm not going back to my tweets about those guys and all that, but he, you, you need guys that, you know, can step in and score 20. I think Holmberg can be one of those guys. I need guys who are cheap too. Yeah, you're there. Uh, you're right there. I think Holberg's going to be a fixture on this roster next season. I still see a pathway where Nick Robertson is dealt. He's got no more options. We've been I saying just that for two years. I don't know what he is. <laughs> I, I don't. And, dude, this is the, it's the, the year 2032. Biggest. Nick Robertson is 37. Is this the year that he gets traded? <laughs> hey, man, I'll be the one to break the trade. But, yeah, like, you need those type of players on your roster. Wanted to put out there as well, sort of feel bad that we didn't have Jeff O'Neill on today. We're we're interviewing Cade Weber uh, later on this week. So we're going to have that interview, I believe, on Friday for you. But Rosie and I are get together on, on Thursday. You talked about the Frozen Four. Boston University is in that. Cade Weber is a shutdown defenseman. Uh, the uh, sixth-round pick that they traded to Carolina uh, to get Cade Weber at the trade deadline. So we're going to sit down with uh, Weber over the next couple days and sort of break down where his game's at and, uh, this guy's a shot blocking machine, as uh, Colby Cohen phrased it to me, which I love to hear if I'm a Leafs fan. So you're saying that's Simone Benoit is what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you and, like that? And, 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 and that's my bit of my gripe here with this Leaf team is, you know, Benoit, again, he, he is a great player for this Leafs team. But how have you not drafted and developed a guy like that? You should have four of those guys, right? Guys don't just turn into, you know, guys aren't developed into a uh, a, a shutdown guy. That's sort of their role. So they should have four or five of those guys on the farm that are ready to step in too. So when you're drafting and developing, you got to keep that in mind. Yes, you have to have your superstars. Yes, you want to have a Makar back there and you want to have an Ekholm, but you need big, solid, strong guys too. So if I'm tree living now drafting, I'm keeping that in mind. Big, strong guys that can skate and shut down because those guys are a commodity, um, you know, come playoff time. So even if you draft and develop them, they don't work out for you. Just look at all the guys that they've traded for these last couple of years and Labushkin and, uh, you know, Giordano that are turning to shut down guys. Again, that, draft and develop those guys. Let's go. Hey, you want to talk about non-believers? Uh, our, um, our mutual friend, Devontae smith Pelly was just bombarding my phone last night. You got to have a conversation with that guy. He he is not believing in this team. He does not believe in this Maple Leafs yeah, team. Yeah, he, he says that, but he's going to be the first guy at the parade I know. with his poppy mustache I said, and shirt I on. said, hey, DS, I'm like, hey, Devo, who is that guy out on with you on King Street West when the Leafs beat the Tampa Bay Lightning? Granted, Devo kept rolling his eyes at me. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? I'm like, whatever. It's a reason to party at Parlor on King Street West. We're going to do it. But yeah, we we had a conversation last night. He doesn't believe in this team. Granted, somebody who did it in the last 10 years, of course, the Washington Capitals got into a little conversation with the goaltending and right place, right time and and puck luck. Everything's got to come together. I do feel and I do believe in this team more than I have in uh, other iterations of this team. Like, I think they have what it takes. And I know we say it every year, but I do at the very least like the way this team is playing. I think it's got a bit of a different feel this season. I think so. And it goes back to talking about the depth and unsung heroes and guys that are outperforming their cap hit and, and young guys stepping up and, you know, calling guys up from the minors and them performing as well. And, you know, goaltending, you know, going through the adversity and coming up on the right side of it, especially teams being special, uh, dealing with the adversity of ha- not having uh, your top defenseman or your top winger in the lineup and not having a big, big dip. So in years past, when that happened, it was the sky was falling in on the team. The sky was falling on the media. They were packing up the parade stuff. But again, all those tests that they've had throughout the year, um, they did not necessarily have passed with flying colors, but they passed it the most part where they're now sitting, uh, you know, comfortably in third place. Right. And if you told me about all mm-hmm. that adversity at the beginning of the year, 
we I think the conversation, the narrative would be, well, the Maple Leafs probably are going to be fighting for a playoff spot. But again, they were talking about them getting 100 plus points this year. They're going to do it again this year. Consistently, they have been consistent in the regular season. But again, where the money's made and everyone uh, is is judged is on in the playoffs. But I think they're geared up um, and they're built a little bit different where I believe this year they're going to go on a, an extensive run. And to be fair, Rosie uh, is very, very annoyed with my saying every season, I don't care about the regular season. So it's time to care about something, and that's the Stanley Cup playoffs, 18 days away. The Botano wrap-up is presented by Botano.ca. The game starts now, 19+. plus. Please play responsibly. Botano is the official partner of Copa America 2024, taking the beautiful game to new heights in the Americas. Join Botano on their journey of passion, unity, and unforgettable football moments. So just looking briefly at tonight's card, Maybe a response here from the Florida Panthers on the road against the Montreal Canadiens. Um, Washington and Buffalo draws my interest. I think we could see some scoring in that game. And I maybe the New Jersey Devils over the Pittsburgh Penguins. The Pens uh, surprising, I think, a lot of people last night with that win on Broadway against the Rangers. Stewie, I think you've been muted. Again. I'm going to be taking a look go. at Vancouver versus uh, Vegas. I think it's going to be a good game. Uh, I think I'm a little short on sleep, so I don't know if I'll be watching. I'll be watching the highlights. But uh, Washington, a big game uh, for the Washington uh, Capitals tonight. And uh, I, I'm going to call a win over the Sabres, who have been struggling a little bit as of late. And I'm going to call two goals for Ovi. So, yes, oh. if, if it hits, give me all the credit. If not, um, you know, go uh, complain at Vic. Don't Don't complain to me. Producer Vic's going to get the brunt of it for sure. And I mentioned uh, on yesterday's show, I randomly bumped into Producer Vic at Two Cats, and it was the best moment of my life over the weekend. So we'll leave it at that. I wanted to mention as well, I've touched base with Jeff O'Neill. We're going to try to do this thing tomorrow. Unfortunately, it's going to be Jay Rosal and not you. So no reunion for you, uh, for, for you, Stu, tomorrow. Yeah, the O-Dog's ducking me. He's ducking me. Yeah. I, him. I think I saw him at a Matt Nickel party or something. A couple Probably. Years ago. I haven't seen him, yeah. but again, all love for O-Dog. He's a great guy. Great analyst as well, too. He tells you exactly how it is, and he's a Leaf legend as well. So, you know, it's good to see O-Dog doing well. Dude, uh, you are in playoff form. Um, you, you do a great job every show, but like, this is a lot of fun. I think we broke down a lot of shit. I don't know what I'm going to cut from this show, but there's a lot to, to grasp, man. Great. Try stuff. not to cut anything controversial. You always cut the most controversial stuff. And I got to go to battle on X and Twitter about, you know, some random thing that it came from a 30 second point. You take two seconds out of, come on, cut me some slack. Give me, don't give me too much hot takes on there. Come on. Stu, the best thing that's happened to your broadcasting career in the last week is that some idiot had a hotter Edmonton Oilers take than you ever did. Uh Uh-oh, what did he say? He said, what did he say? Campbell's coming back to win? (laughs) No, some guy talking about Zach Hyman being privileged. So we're we're all forgetting about Jack Campbell. No, We don't need to talk about Jack Campbell and your take about him winning the (laughs) Vezina Trophy. (laughs) And I'll leave it at this. It says uh, the goal of Twitter is to never – every day there's a main character on Twitter. The goal is to never be it. So I'm just happy that I've abided by that rule. I think I was close a couple times. Never be the main character for that day of Twitter. (laughs) I am probably the main character on Twitter, and that's okay. So that's Anthony Stewart, Jay Rosso, back in the mix for the Wednesday edition. Again, we'll have uh, Jeff O'Neill alongside the O-Dog coming up. Uh, Producer Vic, excellent job. Everybody in the chat, you guys are great at the Leafs Nation 401. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. For Anthony Stewart, I'm Nick Alberga. We'll talk tomorrow as we preview the Leafs and the Lightning. Take care. Make sure to check out more of our content right here on the Leafs Nation YouTube page. We got long form interviews, we got clips, you got epic rants by Jay Rozo. We simply have it all. And don't forget, you can find out much more at theleafsnation.com. Thanks so much for watching.